to this day um, were granted by the Franco era, by the Franco, um, um, I guess, dictatorship. The dictatorship, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so they, so it, like it's important to say that like the Franco dictatorship did a lot of stuff and the and the economy grew a lot under right. Franco, but it was because there was like low hanging fruit. Like Spain was developmentally really far behind France and Germany and North exactly. At that it could point. have been better. So, it could have been better if it was open, but yeah. at least it, at least it kept um, it kept the identity. I would say, and then. I think as soon as it opened up, Spain sort of lost its identity. I think it was necessary that Spain opened up, but at the same time, you know, there's there, there's pitfalls that comes with that, you know, and um, obviously wanting to be like other areas. And I think this is where where Spain sort of uh, lost its identity in a way um, by you know ripping up a lot of native grape varieties and planting. French, more marketable grape varieties like Cabernet, Syrah, Chardonnay, you know, now you're starting to see a movement back towards native and a lot of regrafting. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, obviously, you know, the political situation has a lot to do with, you know, that's, that's why I think there's so much history behind wine, because it really is affected by, you know, politics and the moment and you know, the social moment and everything, really. Yeah. So Fra so Franco died in 75 and Juan Carlos, the new king, led the transition to democracy. And that sort of happened like 75 to 82. And I put Was that it in 75 or 79? I think 75 is when Franco died. Okay. And and then, and then Juan Carlos, it was like a slow process sort of. The transition. It was, it was of transitioning. Transition. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, because there was there was a there was a, an attempted military coup in eighty one, right, and that, and right. that failed, and so right. it was like after that coup failed, and there was the first like peaceful transition of power. It was like okay, this is really a democracy. But so that's important because then, because Spain was a democracy, then they could join the EU. So in nineteen eighty six, Spain joined the EU and joined like the the common economic bloc, right. and then. Spain was one of the first adopters of the euro in 99. And once right. Spain adopted the euro, then it was like really, e it was a lot easier to export wine to Britain and Germany, you know, and that, and that helped, right. that helped the, the overall Spanish wine industry. But like under, under Franco, what I said here is that like, for like the Franco government, it's really easy to judge production and like yield per hectare it's really hard to judge something subjective like quality so the franco government was focused on like increasing production of kilos of grapes and stuff like that that's exactly right but not so that's into quality like because they, right. they just they were bureaucrats and they couldn't measure quality so like they this quality is, and diversity went out the window this is why the the some of the highest grown or, or sorry uh, most produced grapes in Spain are Airen and Palomino right. Fino and um, Albariño because they're very productive grape varieties. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then also, as Spain joined, as Spain became a democracy and joined the Euro, that led to a whole lot more tourism from Britain and from Germany. Um, and I I think that that was actually kind of important because you had like millions of relatively affluent people coming to Spain specifically to like go on vacation and like eat food and to this, to this day tourism is the number one industry. Yeah. Okay. So so like it was this huge industry that brought in a whole lot of money and created right. demand for food and for wine and that like that helped fuel this explosion of, of like serious restaurants of a serious like food and wine culture. Um, right. And then, right. and then all of those tourists like went home and they took this appreciation for Spanish food and wine. And that like raised Spain, Spanish cuisines profile, like internationally and stuff. Right. Right. I think the, the molecular gastronomy also, had a big role in okay. elevating uh, uh, Spain's um, food uh, image or, or, or uh, reputation. 
like the Ferran Adria with El Bulli and, um, you know, Arzac and uh, Jose Andres and all these, all these people, I think, really gave Spain and the Spanish brand, um, you know, a great name in food. Um, regarding wine, I wanted to take what you said a step further. Um, you know, there's definitely a, more of a focus on quality and stuff, but even the economic situation, regardless of the production and tourism, there's still, Spain has always been battling unemployment. The un unemployment rates in Spain are so high amongst young people, you know, under 25, I think it's almost 50%. Uh, uh, in, in the South, it's, it's, it's uh, unemployment is 20% generally, regardless of age. And I think the unemployment in the big cities really uh, pushed a lot of people uh, into the countryside. And this is where you start to see a lot of the natural wine start to be, to, to be produced. So first there was a step towards quality and now there's a step towards organic and natural because you have a lot of people that are recovering you know, their family's old vineyards or whatever and don't really have the e economic means to build a winery so they're literally making wines with 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 very minimal um, equipment intervention, aka uh, natural winemaking. Yeah. You know, um, so I think that's that's um, you know a, 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 a really important point uh, to make. Yeah, and to I actually, add to what I, you were yeah, saying. Yeah, I added that. That's uh, then I have like a bunch of bullet points on here. High unemployment was one of them. That like. You know, if you can't get a normal like corporate job, but like some people were like, well, I can't get a job here in the city. Uh, I'll go back to my like family's vineyard and like right. at least my family's it's a, got it's a quality vineyard. of life choice. Exactly. Um, and then also, yeah, that Spain, Spain has all these wine regions that are not as well known internationally that don't have like a, a really clearly defined expectation of what they are. So like. Uh -huh. You know, if the example I thought of was like, okay, if you're like a young person in Bordeaux and you want to make like Pet Nat from Chenin Blanc, good luck doing that in Bordeaux. Yeah. <laughs> you do something like that in Bordeaux, like no people one's going to want it. Like but, but, you know, if you're in like, like Navarra or somewhere like that in, right. in Spain it's where that, that, has, that has no reputation, you can do whatever you right. want. Right, right. It's 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 sort of a, a blank canvas, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, One hundred percent agree. And then I also like, a lot so, of these people that we represent are defining their regions, Ned. You yeah. know, so it's really cool to be a part of it and to see it. Like for example, we were just talking, you know, at our at our past tasting, we were talking about um, about Cueva um, mm -hmm. and how he's got sort of uh, a whole uh, sort of army of young winemakers that, um, that are following in his footsteps and have very much become sort of protégés, you know? So a lot of these people are marking, uh, marking the way, marking the path for a lot of the younger generation coming behind them, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's the wines that I've got today. That was sort of... That was what I was trying to do. Wines, wines from winemakers that are like sort of breaking the rules or pushing the boundaries. Um, so everybody, let's jump into wine number one. This is the XL from Partita. That's a great Cruz. example. Yeah, great example. Twenty eighteen, and this is I, this is also this is a good example because we were just talking about like young young people going and making wine, but this is actually like a relatively older couple. Right. Like Italian so, couple. Yeah, it's but, it's. A, I, sorry, go ahead, Ned. No, uh, just just that like it's it's all all different people from like different walks of life that are that are sort of right. leading this movement to in natural wine and to create like new unusual styles and stuff. Right. I love that you picked this wine one because it's one of our more iconic, most iconic producers. And I'd say just iconic uh, uh, producer in general, in, in uh, natural wine generally. Um, but also because as an Italian couple coming into Barcelona, they didn't want to work with the international grape varieties that they would come across. They wanted to find native grape varieties of the region. And they were always the crazy Italians working with these native grape varieties that nobody thought they wanted. 
uh, until Partita Cruz became super successful. And now everyone wants to, wants to work with these grapes. And, and um, sometimes it really takes someone from the outside to show people on the inside to value what's theirs, you know? Um, and this is what they did, um, you know, when everybody had written off uh, Sumol and Charello, which is what you're drinking for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, these guys were very adamant about recovering these, these, these local native grape varieties because that's what they felt was the, um, you know, Penedes identities. What vintage, Ned? So is this, is this just like classic pet nat? This is just bottled That's with the primary fermentation. Right, yeah. right. So um, they literally, every still wine they make, they also make in the sparkling format. So they'll take a small part of, of what they make. They'll bottle it, let it keep fermenting in the bottle. And the other one, they'll let ferment dry and it'll become a still wine. Um, but literally every wine they make, they make sparkling and still, which which is fun for the consumer and a pain in the ass for the importer and distributor. <laughs> yeah, ah, uh, that's awesome. But that's anyway, awesome, and I believe it. You're actually right. you're on the handout, Alvaro, as one of the reasons why like the Spanish wine industry is changing and growing is that there's people like you like doing that work, like dealing with producers who produce like a whole lot of these different wines that are all unique. Right. That like. 20 years ago, um, you know, like a big importer would look at look at Partita Creos and be like, this isn't worth it. Like you're too small and you make too many it's different not. wines. I they don't want make, to deal with you. No, they make 30 different wines and like a thousand bottles per cuvee, you know? So uh, anyone that's really looking to make money in wine would, in their, in, in, would not in their right mind work with, with a producer like this. Right. For us, yeah, we're not making money off of it, but it really has made a name for us and put us on the map as importers. So it was well worth it in our eyes, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and like 20 years ago, good luck selling, you know, a pet nat, you know, Shirello Sumol for like $30 or something like that. But like, right, right. there are more exactly. and more wine consumers who like are who have who are better ed educated or just like more experienced and want to try new right. things right. and are willing to like look at things like this and so it's, hey, it's the Ned, market is out of, curi out of curiosity did you ever taste um the first uh the first drop of partita creos we got they made a red wine called inquieto which means unstill it was a monastrel did you ever work with that wine i'm did you have it open at your tasting your very probably. first tasting. Yeah, I think I, I think I remember tasting it there, but very, like you didn't, very, you didn't like physically very, have it yet or something. Very Lambrusco like, right? Yeah, it was a sparkling yeah. red. Yeah, that was Massimo and Antonella's Italian background. They wanted to make a Lambrusco type wine. They made the Inquieto, and they realized they could do that with literally any grape, and that's when they decided to start making all the pet nats. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, all right, so let's move on. So instead of going to wine number two, because wine number two is not one of Alvaro's and we only have Alvaro for a limited amount of time, let's move on to wine number three, which is the Corta Eraspa Anina Ooh. here. So this, this hits home. This hits home because this is where I'm from. Uh, I'm from Sevilla. This wine comes from Cadiz. They're both provinces in Andalusia, which is south of Spain. And this is um, a still wine being made in the Sherry Triangle. It's a unfortified Palomino Fino um, that's uh, fermented and aged in Manzanilla barrels. So Manzanilla is a type of Sherry, dry Sherry, that's made in San Lucar, uh, which is where they are. Uh, and this is coming from a specific site, uh, which is Pago Um And the, the, the vineyard name should be on the label as well, is it um, Las Cuarenta? Uh, Albury, no, uh, Tosca Serrata. Los 40? Uh, it say my, oh, De, De La Vina. De La Vina. De La Vina, Las 40. Las 40, that's the name of the vineyard. Okay. So, so this is from the estate Anina, 
from yeah. the, and inside of the Anina estate, you have the the vineyard name, which is Las Cuarenta. All okay. right. Um, and this is a, a group of, of farmers, um, uh, also known as Mayetos, uh, hence the name Mayeteria Sanluqueña. So this is a group of Mayetos from San Lucar that got together to make wines the old school way. So true farmers making wines with minimal intervention and their production is so low that they sort of um, got together and formed a group to pool resources, you know, pool uh, sales, promotion, uh, travel, um, you know, just make it uh, economically viable to, to produce and sell wine. And uh, we brought in two of the four wines because when we met, um, two of them had already sold out. Uh, but we're hoping to have all four wines uh, in the future. And uh, it's just a, a very special region that has a very unique uh, ocean influence terroir and uh, made in this format, I think, is how it um, is best expressed without interference of Solera blending uh, uh, or fortification. You know, this is this is yeah, literally correct just me, correct me if I'm wrong, but like it seems like they're super traditional, like their farming is obviously very traditional, but the the, the style of wine, the winemaking is very traditional and old it's, school. It's, it's not that they're, old. they're not setting out to like do something crazy and different. It's no. just that like they've been doing this for generations and now there's right. finally people like us that are paying attention to it. Right. They didn't know that the way wine was made before, they didn't know there was a market for that. <laughs> so now they're realizing it and this is the way they've always wanted to do this, do things. Unfortunately, sometimes the market pushes you in a different direction, but this is just the old school, you know, Mayeto, how, how Mayetos would always make wine. In, in San Lucar, everybody makes wine because everybody has vines. So um, this is just the way wine was made at home and they didn't realize that, that, that there was a market for it and that people would appreciate it. They always you know, saw wine as an analogical product when really it's not. Wine should be an agricultural product. Yeah, yeah. Uh, does this, so how is this, does this, like, does this ferment under floor at all? So no, these barrels are topped off, but there's there's the memory of the floor from the Manzanilla barrels. Oh, okay, they're Manzanilla barrels. Okay, right, all right. Right, they're Manzanilla barrels. So, so you're gonna have that imprint. You're gonna have that memory of the floor, regardless of being topped off or not. Yeah, okay, cool. And so it's those, not like, yeah, because it doesn't taste oxidative. Like it's not an no. oxidative wine but it right. does have that little, 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 like that touch of the right. flavor right. of floor. Um, for yeast. those of you that don't know what floor is, floor is a, a, veil, a, a, a veil of yeast that, um, that sort of develop to protect wine from excessive oxidation when you're not topping barrels off. Um, so uh, it, 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 it gives the wine a certain, uh, sorry, the wine a certain profile. Um, in this case, it has a little bit of that floor quality without uh, technically being aged under floor. Yeah. Yeah, this sort of, this, this wine blows my mind. Both of these, like, that, A, that they're not expensive. Uh, right. B, that, you know, right. they were produced, like, 600 bottles of it produced, right. and, like, and we got a bunch of it. And then right. it's so expressive. It's, like, it's so I, clean. I, I'm so in love with these wines uh, and the people, man. The people behind this project, just really authentic, really down to earth, San Luqueños. They're just proud San Luqueños. Don't even mention Perez around these guys. You know what yep. I'm saying? <laughs> it's it's salty and like fresh and a little bit almondy and like appley. It's yeah, it's 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 a lot of times it's like you know, it, it's chalky, right? It has has that grip. This is yep. a lot of the Albarisa. One of the things that makes this region so unique is the Albarisa soil, which is um, uh, pretty much like a chalk. It's like a white sand, very rich in calcium carbonate that retains moisture and reflects sunlight, keeping uh, uh, vineyards fresh, alcohol levels down. I mean, this is one of the hottest regions in Spain and this wine is only 12% alcohol. 
um, and preserves a lot of great acidity and freshness. Um, you know, so it has a lot. This the the, the soil. It's composed of like decomposed conch and uh, uh, marine fossils and all of this stuff that shows in the wine. You can literally taste it. How how far from the ocean are they? Uh, San Luca is on the ocean. Uh, yeah. they're, they're probably you know, I would say a couple kilometers max. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's very, very, very Mediterranean. So I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen this specific vineyard to be honest with you, Ned. But I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if you could see the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know? Well. Yeah. All right. Oh, and then, we're tasting. We're tasting this today. Yeah. Calzone. Yeah. Oh, you've got that open. Cool. <clears throat> yeah. This yeah. is the 20, 2019 from Gr Granada, which uh, I'll, I'll remind everybody, Granada was the last part of Spain that was ruled by the Moors. It was still ruled by the Moors up until 1492. So, bam. There's still a lot of Moorish influence. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of La Lambra. It's uh, uh, an old mosque that is, um, you know, been conserved to this day. Beautiful, beautiful, um, you know, uh, Moorish architecture. And uh, yeah, it's still very present to this. The Moorish influence is still very present in this, in, in this area to this day. Um, and uh, more specifically, Calzon is in Sierra Nevada. So um, uh, a mountain range in uh, uh, Southeast Spain. These wines are made of 1400 meters of altitude, which are some of the highest vineyards, at least that I'm aware of in Europe, I'd say. Um, when you talk to Ramon Calzon, the winemaker, um, he always, you know, when he's asked, um, you know, where he is, he's, he's, he tells people he's not in Southern Europe, that he's in Northern Africa, because he finds that the climate is more similar to African climate than it is to the rest of Europe, you know? So, it says a lot about the, the terroir that he's dealing with. Um, he's in the desert, essentially. Um, uh, red sand, as far as the eye can see, just so you guys can imagine what this is like. Um, this whole area is, uh, is called La Alpujarra Granadina. It's where Clint Eastwood used to film Spaghetti Western because it was cheaper to film there than it was to film here in the States. So, um, a lot of those uh, spaghetti westerns were made in this region because it does look like the Mojave. It looks like the Mojave. It looks like Arizona. It looks like these these areas. Um, and uh, um, his big problem is that he's dry farming in the desert. So uh, very little rain, uh, which means very low yields for him. Uh, his his uh, yields are are a joke, honestly. Um, you know, if, if conventional um, uh, uh, Tempranillo produces eight kilos per vine, he's producing one. So he's getting literally one eighth of what conventional standards um, allow. And then, um, but I think that concentration mixed with the freshness and acidity that you get as a direct result of the altitude just makes for incredibly balanced, fresh, really just pretty clean. He's got a very delicate touch in his wine. I always say he's not much of a winemaker, you know? He yeah. literally doesn't do anything. He just tries not to mess up his, 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 his material, you know, which is just a, a product of incredible terroir. Yeah, yeah. And so his background, he, he was a chef. He was a professional chef for like 15 right. years, right? Right, yeah. He, he was a chef up and down the coast of Brava working in some of these high, you know, alta gastronomy, high gastronomy um, places like El Bui and uh, cut his teeth on, on a lot of uh, French and natural wine. And that's why um, he started going to like a lot of the French natural wine salons and, and all this. And, um, you know, uh, when he decided that, you know, it was a career that he wanted to pursue um, he uh, stumbled upon Barranco Oscuro, who is another uh, producer from Granada, who's been making wine in this region since, natural wine in this region since 1979. So he went to, to Barranco Oscuro, worked with them, learned from Manolo directly, and then that's when he took off his own project. 
um, on the north side of Sierra Nevada, where Barranco Oscuro is on the south side of, of Sierra Nevada. Are you familiar with Barranco Oscuro, man? Not really, no. Okay, no. it's a Savio Suarez selection, but um, a pioneers in natural wine. They've been making natural wine in Granada, again, since like the 70s. Okay. So um, he's and, on the uh, north side. So he's on the north side yeah. of the Sierra Nevada. Does that mean most of his vineyards are north facing? All of his vineyards are north facing. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. yeah so that, that's where, that's why you get this freshness. Yeah. Less, less sun. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Cool. Right. Low alcohol, high acid, yeah. um, which I think is where you want to be, especially being in such a hot region, you know, yeah. This during the summer, it can literally get to like 120 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah. and at night drop down to 60. So we're talking okay. diurnal shift of 60 degrees. No, you're laughing, man, but I ain't I'm laughing because it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, it really is insane. I mean, he's higher than Cornelison. How high is Cornelison? That's higher than yeah. I mean, Frank Frank's vineyards are like 3,000 feet above sea level. 3,000. Feet. feet. Oh, yeah. So, like a thousand so meters. This, so this is about 4,500 feet. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty insane. Which is, is insane. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also, it's good to point out like he, so how old was he when he started this vineyard? Uh, 20 years ago. I, I want to say late mid, let's say mid nineties. So about okay. 25 years ago. Okay. And he's probably going to be, he's probably in his mid fifties. Yeah. So he was probably in his early, yeah, early 30s when he started this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he sort of like came back here, like to his home and then like started this. Right. So it, yeah. Okay. Right. Cool. This is beautiful. This is drinking great right now. So it's I just like, learned. So this is Tempranillo and it's got a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon in it. We were okay. tasting it. Don't you get a little bit of that pyrazine, like green pepper? I can smell it. Yeah, there's, it's hard because like it's so high elevation, you know, that like that high elevation makes it more like racy and like aromatic and expressive and stuff. But yeah, it has this little like, like crunchy, like, uh, like currenty, like green bell pepper. Yeah. Thing that, yeah. Cabernet Sauvignon. Cool. Yep. It's got a little bit, not even, you know, maybe 5%, mm -hmm. but just enough to give it that touch. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Is there anything else you want to add? Cause that's, that's half an hour. Um, uh, that's it. I just want to thank everybody for listening. Hopefully I didn't uh, ramble too much. I want to thank you for doing this. And um, hopefully everyone's enjoying what they have in their glass. And uh, Ned, you know, you guys are probably gonna keep going. If you guys have any questions or whatever, feel free to share my contact with anybody if they wanna reach out for, for whatever they need, questions, um, you know, Spain recommendations, anything, man, I'm here for you guys. Cool, okay, awesome. All right. I'll do that, I'll pass it on. Great. All right. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks a lot, Alvaro. Hey, Chase. Have a good one. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Have a good afternoon. You too. All right. I am going to hop. Sorry. So now let's hop back to wine number two. Um, so part of uh, part of like the 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 point, I you know, I picked all these different wines because they're all people, winemakers that are sort of like pushing the limits, pushing the boundaries. Um, but it's cool that it's not like a homogeneous, it's not like all young people that worked at nat natural wine bars that are now going and like making natural wine. It's like people like Ramon Savreda at Bodegas Calzon, you know, who like grew up here in the mountains and then went and was a professional chef and then came back to his family's vineyards. Um, like the people uh, like Corta Eraspa, like tiny, tiny, tiny little, like really traditional winemaker, sherry producers down here 
in San Lucar that like they, you know, like they didn't one day decide to make natural wine. They've just been making wine like this for generations, but it was so small production, you know, like they made like uh, 600 bottles. So they made like 50 cases of this, you know, so this, this was probably normally this would have just been consumed like there in the town maybe a couple of local restaurants or bars would have bought it, you know, something like that. And, and that's it. It never would have left the area. Um, so like those guys, the, the guys making those wines there, they didn't set out to like be revolutionary or change things. Like what has changed is that we are interested in it. And there are people like Alvaro, like doing the work to get the wines out of Spain and bring them here um, to us. Uh, something, a couple of things that I didn't touch on with Alvaro that we just didn't get to. Um, so one, increased demand and interest for new wines and wine consumers, you know, from like people like us being interested in wines and starting to treat Spanish wines more like French and Italian wines because like, Spanish wines for a long time have sort of been looked at as, um, uh, you know, just associated with like the place that they come from, or it's been like large mass produced brands where there was more of an appreciation for small individual producers in France and Northern Italy and Germany, where like people really specifically followed like individual producers in Bordeaux or Bourgogne or Chinon or like in the Moselle. Um, and that I feel like has just sort of started to be extended to Spain in the past, you know, like 15, 20 years now that's really happening that people are paying more attention to, um, to individual producers. Um, also, I didn't cover this with, with Alvaro. Um, like a lot, so a lot of these, a lot of these people or these vineyards, like existing vineyards over the past, you know, let's say like 30 years ago, a lot of the production from these vineyards would have been sold off to as a, a, like commodities would have been sold off to like large wineries or to local co-ops or something like that. And so it would have just been like, you know, the wine, the far, they would have just been farmers and the farmer would have gotten like X number of dollars per kilo. Um, the price per kilo for grapes in most of Europe, uh, definitely most of Spain and a lot of Italy, the price per kilo for grapes just being sold to some other winery to make wine has fallen over the past 50 years, the price has fallen, but beyond the price falling, like there's been inflation and cost of living increases. So <clears throat> to farm grapes and just sell the grapes off and not make wine from them, to just sell like the raw grapes and not like wine as a value added product. Um, in a lot of places, the price you can get for your grapes is less than it costs to farm them. Uh, the only way to like actually make money is to drive down all the costs that you possibly can, like mechanize everything, you know, like increase yields as much as you possibly can, you know, and then like maybe you can break even. But the like the result of that is that if I, if Ned, if I was Eduardo in like rural Spain and I had like three acres from my family and I was growing grapes, I'd be like, it doesn't make sense for me to have this vineyard. Like it's not worth me spending my time to farm it. I should either sell the vineyard or I should just stop working on it because it's not worth my time. Or three, instead of selling the grapes off and losing money on it, I should try making wine myself. And then, you know, if I turn these couple thousand kilos of grapes, if I turn them into wine, then I can sell the wine for, you know, like two euros a bottle or something where instead I'm selling my, a kilo of grapes for like 20 euros of a kilo or something like that. Um, and that's part of why there are all of these new small producers is because 
in the past they could sell their grapes off and like make a living that way and now they can't anymore and so they like they just don't economically have any choice like they've got to do something and some of them don't want to like sell this land that has been in their family um so there you go and part of that part of what's going on is that wine consumption in spain and italy has been falling people are drinking less wine over there they're drinking more beer they're drinking more cocktails they're just generally drinking less um Spain is famous for having like two hour siestas in the middle of the day and then having dinner at 10 o'clock at night, you know, and getting up at like nine or 10 o'clock in the morning and all of that. But that's slowly going away as they integrate into the rest of the European economy and have to like answer the phone in the morning and stuff like that. Um, I, I, so it sounds like a joke, but that's real. That's actually like what's going on. Um, so the Spanish, and the, the Italians and the French are all drinking less. And that's also part of what has driven down the price of bulk grapes. Also, <clears throat> that's part of why wines like, like this, the Corte Raspa that you know is, is uh, amazing and brilliant, but they only made 600 bottles of it. Like, you know, a generation or two ago, they could have easily sold all of that there in the town. You know, or maybe maybe like that family just drank so much wine that they would have drunk all of it themselves. But but now because per capita wine consumption in Spain is lower, instead of selling it all locally, they're like, they don't have a, the local market for it. So they like people are still making all this wine, but demand there is lower now. So they have to figure out like what to do with the rest of this wine. So, you know, 20 years ago, if Alvaro had called them up and said, like, hey, I want to buy your crazy, you know, non-oxidative Palomino Fino, they would have been like, no, we're, we're going to sell it all here. We're going to drink it. Now Alvaro goes and calls them up and they're like, oh, you want to buy our wine? Great. Like we, we want to sell it to you. Here you go. It's, it's available to you now. So um, that I didn't really include that in the handout here, but that's also, that's what has happened in a lot of Europe. And that has like opened the door to people like us being able to get these cool, exciting, things. So now I am going to rinse my glass and I'm going to go back to wine number two, the Rumbera. Uh, this is a Jose Pastor wine, so I did not ask Alvaro to talk about it because Alvaro, you know, it's sort of outside of his wheelhouse and it's sort of an unusual DO. This is a, you know, so it's another good example. So Oriol Artigas, La Rumbera. Uh, this is made from the grape Ponzo Blanco. I don't know what Ponzo Blanco is. Uh, I've never heard of it before. Let me see if I can do screen share here. Screen share, share, cool. Here we go. Uh, 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 uh. Here we go. There he is, Oriel Artigas. Uh, so the DO is Alea. And Alea is this tiny little forgotten DO over here, 15 kilometers north of Barcelona. So it's right by the Mediterranean. Um, there's, I mean, according to this, this is the uh, Jose Pastor website. According to this, like Oriol Artigas is basically the only guy who's making like really exciting, serious wines here in the area. Um, he wanted, he originally wanted to be a chemist. He had been studying to be a chemist and then he worked a harvest in Penedes, which is like just, I don't know, out over here somewhere. It's in the Barcelona vicinity. And he was like, oh, I would much rather like, this is like uses a bunch of the things I was learning with chemistry, but this is way more exciting and cool. I would rather be a winemaker. Um, so he started making wine sort of for fun uh but like just got sucked more and more into it and now makes these awesome wines so this is um la rumbera panza blanca from seven different parcels uh, all in really granitic soil around alea um fermented with wild yeasts uh two hours to two days of skin contact um no added sulfur yeah so this is this is what is called a zero zero 
wine. This is no sulfur, no filtration. This is this is very natural, as you can sort of tell from how cloudy it is. I bought this, I forget, oh, that's right. I just, Jose Pastor sent me a sample of it and I tasted it like a month ago and I was just fell in love with it and bought a bunch of it. Smells kind of like grapefruit, not like super like sweet ripe grapefruit, but like that, like you smell like grapefruit juice and you smell that slightly like bitter, oily, like pithy aroma. I got celery salt. Celery salt, like it smells a tiny bit piney. Like, yeah, it's like a little bit spicy. And like green and bright and fresh. Granit granitic soils like right on the Mediterranean. So there's definitely a Mediterranean influence. There's definitely like briny, salty, oceanic going on here. Um, in the Jose Pastor write-up, it doesn't say anything about like whether or not Oriel Artigas, you know, was like successful or unsuccessful in finding work as a chemist. But I, I, you know, it's worth mentioning that again, like Alvaro was saying, the youth unemployment rate in Spain, I looked it up last night, I think in, uh, in 2019, the like under 30 unemployment rate was like 20 something percent, maybe 30%. Um, and now certainly with the pandemic, like Alvaro was saying in some parts of Spain, it's like 50%, um, you know, so it's like <laughs> make wine <laughs> or, you know, do something on your own that do, do something creative that at least is your own thing. Yeah, medium bodied, sort of more grapefruit, salt, tiny, tiny bit of like a savory, like it's like a savory sort of thing on the finish that is probably the wine starting to oxidize a little bit because I you know, opened it and poured them last night, but it fits in with the wine. I love the sort of like pithy fruity quality of it. Um, all right. And then going on to, this is wine number five. Uh, Cloloen. So Bodegas Ponce. Cloloen is the wine itself and the grape variety is Bobal. This is another sort of uh, forgotten uh, sort of forgotten or underappreciated D.O. There he is. There's Juan Antonio Ponce. Um, so it's in Castilla-La Mancha, which is a like region of Spain that is, that like produces wine. It's known for wine production, but it's known for like bulk mass-produced sort of supermarket wines. La Mancha. Uh, and particularly, so this is Manchuela, which is inland from Valencia. Has this convenient map here. I think I can just zoom out. So yeah, so Valencia right there. And then he's, so there's Valencia on the coast and then you have these mountains right here. And then Bodegas Ponce is up like sort of in the mountains on the other side of the mountains. So it's a little bit more continental and dry, hot, hotter during the day, cooler at night, drier, less rainfall, windswept. Um, those are a bunch of old vines. Uh, Manchuela Bobal is a grape that is pretty highly productive and um, has a fair amount of pigment and color. So you can produce a lot of it per acre and it still produces wine that's really like dark in color, which is great if you're mass producing supermarket wine. So that's Manchuela and Bobal's reputation. But Juan Antonio Ponce, his family 
uh, has been here for a while and his grandfather had planted vineyards, you know, like 80 years ago. So he got into winemaking. He worked at some other really serious wineries, other places. And then he came back and started his own winery. I think he was 23 when he started Bodegas Ponce. Um, they have a bunch of old vineyards that were planted like 80 years ago on like sandy soil that are ungrafted on like native roots and stuff like that. Um, bush vines like that, Albarello trained. There you can see like those are a bunch of his vineyards. Sunny, dry, um, but relatively low yielding uh, because of the age of the vines and how dry it is. This is very good bobal, but it is still like classic to me, like sort of bobal, like it's juicy, like ripe, rich sort of berry fruit, but then it also has this little hint of like chocolate and earth or something to it, or like mocha, like coffee, like smelling it. It's not just fruity. It's very expressive and open and giving, but it's also kind of um, uh, a little bit more savory. And then it's juicy and kind of chewy. like tart, concentrated, sort of like cherry raspberry fruit that I feel like I can kind of like sink my teeth into. And then I get a little bit of like a, like mocha coffee flavor, like coffee ice cream sort of flavor behind that in the mid palate. And it has some tannin but the tannin is definitely like in line and in balance with all the rest of the flavor components of the wine. So it's not, it's not unbalanced, but it is sort of like a slightly rustic wine. It's a, this is, this is sort of the entry level Bobal that he makes. Like this is a blend of a bunch of different vineyards. Um, and he releases it younger. Then he makes a bunch of different single vineyard Bobals that come from, very different soil types. Like some of it is very sandy, some of it's more like granitic or clay. Um, and they're all extremely expressive and like very, very different expressions of Bob all. But this is like his most sort of like classic traditional Bob all that he produces. And then finally, Finalmente, wine number six. Here's this label that doesn't really tell you what it is at all, which I love. It's I think this is a good like example of of Spain and like New Spain. Um, there's a tiny little over here, product de España. This is a uh, curry uvas e vinos. 2014. This is from Alicante, uh, which is a region just south of, I think it's Valencia. Uh, or am I wrong? Is this Barcelona again? Uh, it's a, this is an area right on the Mediterranean. And it's, uh, it's known, it's another like Castilla La Mancha, it's known for wine production. Like there is a lot, there are a lot of vines here. There's a lot of wine production, but again, it's a lot of like bulk sort of industrial value wine. Um, they don't have a reputation for fine wines or like the, the more expensive fine wines that they produce are um, uh, like sort of just trying to chase like big scores from the wine advocate, like very, very extractive. Um, super quick, Michael asked what the difference is between the Cloloen 
Bobal, and then another wine that they make called Pinot. Uh, Pinot is a single vineyard, significantly older vines. And I'm trying to remember, I kind of answered it in your, in your spiel after I had written it. No, that's thought. okay. Thank um, you. The, P, the Pinot, there's two, I have, I keep working with switching between two different single vineyards from him. Um, the Pinot is a different soil type. I forget if it's granite or sandy. I want to say that it's grand, like broken up granitic soil um, and it's significantly older. The Pinot, drinking it to my palate, the Pinot is is spelled P-I-N-O and it's not, it's not Pinot Noir, it, it is another Bobal. But uh, this other cuvee from Bodegas Ponce is like more refined and more aromatic, uh, lighter, but like more expressive, uh, you know, but like it's still the Bobal grape. It's the same like varieties of Bobal and it's grown in effectively the same climate, just different, very different soil that, you know, makes the grape behave differently. Um, I'm gonna go back to screen share here and hop over to here, Curie. So Curie Tinto, um, so yep, so Dio of Alicante. Oh, right, good point. Um, they are within the Dio of Alicante, but they don't actually use the Dio because Alicante has such a not great reputation uh, that they don't want to put Alicante on their label <laughs> because they, they just don't want to be associated with it. Most people, when they hear Alicante, they just think of mass produced industrial wines. So that's where they are. Yep. So just south of Valencia on that little sort of peninsula that sticks out there into the Mediterranean. Um, so it's a couple, Alberto and Violetta. Um, Violetta comes from a winemaking family. Uh, Gutierrez de la Vega uh, is this lo locally famous old vineyard that her father runs. And then um, Alberto, Alberto uh, Redrado, where does it say? Uh, he comes from a restaurant family. His father and uncle started Lescaleta, um, which is the most famous restaurant in Alicante and has two Michelin stars. So he grew up in that environment, like in that restaurant, and he is a master sommelier. He's like one of the top sommeliers in Spain. So he and Violetta together started Curie. They have three hectares, which is like about eight acres of old head pruned like Alborello vines here near the ocean in Alicante. Um, and they're, you know, what they, what they want to do is they want to make wines that are extremely traditional and really, really express the place, the environment and the traditional grape varieties. So this is made from a grape that locally is called Yero but it's Grenache. It's a local version of Garnacha and a local, you know, like a different clone, a different version of it that they sort of pro compare to Cananao, which is another indigenous version of Garnacha in Sardinia. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then, you know, no, knowing that now and drinking this, like it does it reminds me of Cananao from Sardinia, but probably part of that is that like the climate here is a lot like Sardinia. This is another like sunny, dry, windy Mediterranean place uh, with a lot of, um, uh, what's the right word? Uh, they call it the Maquis in, um, uh, in Corsica, but like it's the same, the same like plants and like like scrub uh, bushes here. So anyway, so this is 100% gyro from a bunch of different plots, all harvested by hand, not destemmed, uh, foot trodden in open vats, 
uh, fermented with wild yeast, 100% whole grape clusters. Then it spends one year in neutral French oak barriques, uh, then a second year in old American oak casks. Um, and then it's bottled without any fining or filtration. Uh, and I believe, it doesn't say here, but I think this is also zero sulfur added to it. Um, the vintage is 2014. Uh, they made about uh, like 240 cases, something like that of, uh, of this wine. Some of those little bottles that you have may throw some sediment because all of these bottles that I was pouring from had a lot of sediment in them. I love the aroma of this. I really love the aroma of this. Like it's got all these aromatic wild herbs to it. The nose is incredible. Yeah, like that. And this, this is, I mean, so this is, this is, a. Uh, all right, I'll start with like these people, like, again, like they're totally different from the other people that we've talked about here, like from uh, the, the elderly Italian couple of architects that started Partita Creus from Juan Antonio Ponce, who was like a really young guy um, starting his winery, Ramon Savreda at Cauzon, you know, these two, this couple, like they're like Italian, they're like food and wine royalty in the local area. And they specifically set out to start a winery making natural wine, but making like really classic, really expressive wine that tasted of and represented the place and their grape varieties and their culture. Um, the aroma is amazing. And, and on the palate, it's amazing. These are flavors that you just can't get without aging the wine. Like this is, this is, those are, those are like secondary and tertiary aromas that you just cannot get without waiting, without patience. In your mind, compare this to the wine that you just tasted. Compare this to the Juan Antonio Ponce Clolo N, which is 2019, you know, which is like very young, fresh, expressive bobal. With that, it's like young and exuberant and you just get all of that fresh, fresh, like raspberry fruit from, from the bobal. If you held that bottle of wine, I'm pointing at it because I'm looking at it right over here next to my computer. If you held that for like six years, it would start to show off all kinds of other flavors. It would get really interesting. I've, I've done that. I've tasted, I've had old bottles of that, of this wine, of this cuvee. Um, but the Curie here, uh, you know, like the flavors that it has, like it's an expression of the place. It's an expression of the version of Garnacha that they have, but those flavors aren't gonna come out. You're not gonna be able to experience them unless you age it. And most wineries can't afford to do that because, you know, then like you've done all the work, you've bought the land, you've paid for all the labor, you've paid for all the equipment, and then you don't actually get to sell the wine and see a return on all of that investment for, you know, in this case, six years most wineries just can't afford to do that. They're lucky that they come from a background and they're working on a small enough scale that they can afford to do that. They can just afford to wait and be like, well, we're gonna wait until this wine is actually what we want it to be and we're gonna sell it for more money and you know, it'll, it's worth it. Um, so it does like smelling it, 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 I mean, it, it makes me imagine that like if I actually got to go there and went to uh, the, the coast of Alicante on the Mediterranean and wandered around in the hills, in the bushes, that I would smell a lot of these aromas that I'm smelling in the wine. That like this is, you know, the like aromatic plants that grow here in the environment. It's just, it's crazy, like cinnamon, like ginger, thyme, like tarragon, oregano, like all kinds of stuff. And then it has a lot of presence on the palate. Um, according to its label, it's 15 and a half percent alcohol, which is, you know, it tastes like it. It is 
it tastes like it, but it's not unbalanced. Um, this is this is like a relatively traditional style. Like Alicante is a place that's hot and sunny, and you know, so if you leave vines to their own devices, the grapes get really ripe and concentrated. They have sugar. The sugar turns into alcohol, and you wind up with wines like this. Um, they must be working on a in a, in a way where you know the yields are low enough and they're harvesting at a right the right time where the grapes still have all of these other flavors to hold up that alcohol and like hold up that structure so they're it's actually a relatively tannic wine you just don't completely notice the tannin because there is that glycerin that viscosity and the ripeness from the alcohol and the sugars and the grapes and actually the aroma I just really smelled like Tootsie Rolls to me. It's big. And I do get those tannins. I get kind of a winter green there in the finish. Um, but it's pretty smooth. For, for like, for what it is, like, I don't really perceive the alcohol. I don't get like an alcohol burn from it. Uh, and it is a pretty lush and uh, it's a, it's a lush wine that's sort of like is uh, deliberative that like, that takes its time that like slowly, slowly moves across your palate as you perceive all of the different flavors that it's got. Um, basically, so that sort of covers like where Spain has been and that, last week and now tasting all of these wines that are sort of like people doing just completely new things or like going back to how things were a long time ago or redefining or defining wine regions that don't yet or currently have a reputation or personality. Um, this is where Spain is and sort of is like the cutting edge of Spain right now. And I don't think this is going to change anytime soon. Like I think this is, this is we're gonna keep seeing more things like this from Spain. Spain, the, the Spanish wine industry is sort of like where Italy was like 40 years ago or something like that, maybe, where back then, you know, like Chianti had a reputation, but there weren't, and there were several, there were, there were like large famous producers in Chianti, but you didn't have you were just starting to have like the super Tuscan explosion and people there like making wines in the Maremma and stuff from like international varieties or other traditional varieties and like breaking outside of the DOC rules. That's happening in Spain now. And I think we're just gonna continue seeing that as it builds more momentum. Um, as I think somewhere in the handout, I mentioned, you know, like increased demand from Wine, consum wine consumers like us, um, how that works, you know, it's like if, uh, if like Juan Antonio Ponce, um, you know, he starts this winery back in 2005 and back in 2005, everybody's like, you're crazy. You're like, why would you want to make your own wine instead of just selling your grapes, go through all the work? Like, what if you, what if you mess up the wine and then you don't have any wine, wine to sell and you lose all your money? Um, you know, you give it like five or six years and then his neighbors see him making more wine and selling all that wine in Britain and Germany and America. And they like see him doing well and being successful and making, you know, four times as much money as if he was selling the grapes off to the co-op. And so then those neighbors are like, oh, well, I, I could do that. Like, I want to, I want to do that. I, I want to be able to buy a new pickup truck or whatever. And so like, then they stop selling their grapes to the co-op and they start sort of like following what he was doing. Um, so I think we're gonna just sort of keep on seeing this 
evolution and development of the Spanish wine industry and like more diversity, more interesting fine wines as Spain and all these different regions slowly define themselves, you know, because the process of defining what a wine region is, um, you know, like Champagne, a thousand years ago, Champagne didn't exist, you know, and it, it took, it took hundreds of years of Champagne trying different things, making different wines, trying out different techniques of making the wine uh, and like refining it and consumers in other places responding to different things for champagne to slowly focus and become what we know it as today. Same deal with like Rioja. Um, so that's where a lot of these wine regions are just starting to sort of like figure out, like make a bunch of different wines and then see what's successful and what's not successful. And then as they get feedback from, from us, from like what we're excited about and what people buy, then they, you know, adapt what they do and follow that. Like Alvaro was saying, Partita Creus, when they started making wine and actually selling it to America, I don't know when that was. I went to Alvaro's like very, very first tasting in New York, like, I don't know, six or seven years ago, something like that. Um, and he had that first sparkling red that they had made, you know, so back then they had just made that because they liked Lambrusco and they wanted to have a fizzy red for them to drink themselves. And now like seven or eight years later, maybe like half of their production is sparkling wine. <laughs> so, you know, give it, give it another like eight or 10 years and all of these wineries and people are going to like, figure out more like what they, what they, what they want to do. Um, that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for listening and going through this and tasting all the wines. Um, I mentioned in the email that I sent out with the handouts, uh, I am not going to have like a limit on how many people do this anymore. Cause I mean, why, why bother? It's Zoom. I can, I think Zoom limits me to a hundred people. So I'll just, you know, include as many people as I can, as are interested up to a hundred people um, and keep doing this for as long as I can, or until I get, it gets to a point where like, you know, I just have to, if I have to spend all day long pouring little tiny sample bottles and I just can't pour any more little tiny sample bottles, then I'll, I run out of sample bottles or something. Um, next week is Bordeaux and I'm super excited to about that because Bordeaux, like I think people sort of gloss over it, but, uh, or just see it as like this one monolithic thing, but it's not, it's not this one monolithic thing. It's, it's a huge wine region. Um, that's, it's actually, it's interesting. It's like, it's that double-edged sword of success. Like Bordeaux has been very successful, but that means you get locked into just being this one thing that people expect. And there are a lot of people in Bordeaux like struggling with that and being like, well, I'm not Chateau Margaux. Like, what do I do? Like, how, what should, how do, how can I be successful and like do something that's fun and interesting and differentiate myself from everything else that's out there? So, um, so next week is going to be fun also because I've gotten some new, interesting, exciting zero sulfur Bordeaux in, in the past couple of days. So. Uh, that's it. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. I will uh, see you later.